All right, good afternoon. I think we are live right now. Welcome to the event, A Common Policy for Climate, How to Avoid a Catastrophic Future. My name is Emanuele Bonpan. I'm the editor-in-chief of the magazine Renewable Matter. And I'm here today with a very distinguished panel to talk about uh, uh, the situation, the global situation in the process uh, of achieving carbon neutrality. And we will be talking about negotiation. We will be talking about politics. Uh, about the economy uh, and the panel with us is very, very special. Let me just introduce the list of the panel that are here today with us at the Festival della Diplomazia. Uh, we have uh, uh, Tosca Barucco, Special Envoy of the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Cooperation for COP26. Mr. Corrado Clini, former Minister of Environment of, the Italian, uh, of Italy. Uh, William Mebane, Energy Economist. Ilian Kelman, Professor of Disaster and Health at the University College of London, England, and the University of Agder Christiansen in Norway. Uh, William Baker must be arriving soon. He is the Executive Director of Presidential Climate Action Project in Washington, DC. Uh, Gian Maria Sannino, Head of Climate Impact Modeling Laboratory uh, from Enea. He must be coming soon. If you're already online, sorry for not seeing you, but it's a very long list of people online I'm right online. now. Hi, hi, Gian Maria, welcome. And then we have Joseph Abramovic uh, joining us uh, from Jerusalem. He's a president and co-founder of Energia Global. And of course, Grazia Francescato, environmentalist, journalist, and former WWF president. Well, thank you all so much for being here today. And uh, you know, this discussion is gonna last one hour and a half and we wanna have a first round of questions and then we will move uh, to a more uh, Q&A section by myself, but also from uh, uh, the public. Uh, I remember that there are over 100 students following us today in this panel, and we will try to uh, give them the clearest and most interesting perspective about climate change and climate negotiation uh, at global scale. Uh, I would like to chat with uh, Tosca Barucco. She's the special envoy of the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, and, uh, and International Cooperation for COP26, which is going to be the next uh, round of negotiation for climate change. Uh, Tosca, I would like to ask you what is uh, the situation in the neg negotiation and why Italy uh, and why it's going to be even more important for Italy uh, and why it's going to have a major presence in this uh, negotiation. Tosca, the floor is yours. Well, uh, as you know, uh, the COP26 uh, will be the fifth COP after the agreement uh, in Paris. So uh, it will be extremely important, not only because we should, uh, uh, let's say, give an impulse to fully implement the Paris Agreement, the so-called technically Paris rule book, and we should try to get into the some open negotiating issue like the loss and damage, transparency. I don't want to make it too technical. It's a basically how uh, to uh, rewomp the process. Uh, at the end of 2020, the countries uh, will have to present more ambitious NDCs. What is an NDC? An NDC, it's a country, voluntary country planning on how to curb emission and how to address, uh, uh, not only, uh, also how to address uh, the challenges of climate change, both uh, as mitigation and adaptation. So basically uh, what we'll be also doing uh, is uh, an, an event uh, as anniversary, but not just a celebration, but also still taking on the 12th of December, uh, we are the co-presidency of COP26 with the UK, but we join forces with the UN, uh, France and the Chilean presidency to, ho to host the Ambition Summit. Uh, so in this Ambition Summit, we will ask the countries to renew their commitments and to be bold and to give uh, more ambitious commitments on the way of uh, uh, addressing climate change. Uh, I know that uh, in, uh, this, uh, um, in this uh, panel, you wanted to address, uh, you know, the disasters and how the um, climate crisis is affecting us. But I'm also here to bring some 
good uh, good news. Sorry to go a little bit sketchy. For instance, uh, from 2010 uh, to now, the price of uh, renewables uh, uh, and especially of solar has uh, fallen by 85%. Wind uh, power has a fall 45%. Battery costs, you know that for renewable, the problem is the stockage of the energy. The battery cost has fallen 45%. So uh, we are uh, having increasing energy efficiency gains. So while a lot is needed to uh, reach the Paris uh, objective, of uh, raising temperatures, but less, uh, less than two degrees, and most uh, hopefully 1,10, 1,5, sorry, uh, we uh, uh, could see uh, some positive signal. And another very positive signal, I must say, is the involvement on the, uh, to, on, of the young generation for uh, the climate uh, uh, crisis. So we've seen a grassroots movement. We see a lot of civil society supporting the, the science and the evidence. So I must say that while uh, it's a big challenge and the COVID put us extra stress on it because now we have the moral duty to build bet back better. That is for sure, but we also have uh, uh, more difficulty to, um, to engage in uh, an energy uh, tran transition pattern that will cause uh, a structural adjustment to, to, to a lot of sectors. Uh, we, we're going to face it. You know, the good news that renewables in most countries are, much che are, are now cheaper than fossil, it's also something that could help us in, the, uh, in looking at the future as a future of commitment, but also as a future of hope. Um, biodiversity, we see that there is a lot of, uh, uh, we are preparing the, the conference mm -hmm. of biodiversity, but uh, um, that as COP26 was postponed to next year, but uh, we are seeing that uh, there is an, a rising awareness of the importance of relationship between people and nature. Now with COVID-19, COVID uh, remember that uh, when we destroy and degrade biodiversity, we uh, increase the risk of spread of diseases from wild, wildlife to, to people. So on the finance, you know, of course, the problem is uh, uh, the finance for climate, what the developing countries are, are, and not only them, and then we should question who's developing in this stage, but that uh, we might leave it to the second part of the discussion. So what we also see that the finance will be a cornerstone of the transition and Italy has joined the coalition of minister uh, of finance minister for climate action. So uh, we are committed. We have done our homework at home. We are uh, doing, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the within the EU framework, uh, we are playing a role of an ambitious country. So uh, what we should uh, also uh, look uh, is uh, how to increase uh, investment uh, in renewables. Uh, you, uh, we had uh, uh, to, uh, an increase of investment in renewable in 2019. We hope that this positive trend will keep and will uh, help us into, into the uh, energy transition pattern. Uh, if you don't mind, I will also give us the announcement that Italy uh, is, will be hosting a Youth for Climate 2021 event and the pre-COP in Milan. And I'll be delighted to go back to these que um, questions later. Thanks a lot, Emanuele. I hope, uh, I hope uh, you, uh, you, yeah. you, you, you uh, can, wanna, we can come back to that. I want to just uh, have you a, a very quick question. Do you think Europe will be able to play a major role in the next negotiation, uh, especially after you know, all the announcement with the Green Deal and the uh, next generation EU? Can we see a stronger Europe in the next COP26 negotiation? I, I would say so, also because, uh, of course, we all know that, that in Paris, uh, 
the, the story goes that at the end of the day, it was Obama and the Chinese to, 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 to give uh, the, the deal, uh, the, the closure of the deal. But uh, even if Europe now, thanks to the, the effort of everybody, is only 9% of world emission, mm -hmm. we are leading by example because we are also showing that what we do can be done by others and that we keep on growing and we keep on having a welfare state. So uh, let's say that the example of that Europe can give uh, and the, the commitment of the 37% of resources in the Green New Deal to, to, to the Green Recovery, I think it's a, it's a major investment uh, also in the credibility of the EU. And uh, the European public opinion is ready for that and is pushing their leaders. So I'm quite optimistic, but uh, of course, uh, we will see also how the post-pandemic recovery uh, will play. Thanks. 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 Well, right now, we don't know exactly which role is the US going to play in the climate negotiation because of the, of the election. What we know for sure is that China has decided to be at the front stage uh, uh, so it's actually already five years that China is playing a major role in negotiation and uh, and recently has announced uh, to go to become carbon neutral in 2060, which is a major step for such a, a fundamental economy and for such a great emitter as well. I would like to ask uh, to Corrado Clini exactly which role might play China and what China is actually doing to uh, decarbon decarbonize its economy. Corrado Clini, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon to the young in this uh, panel. I'm very happy to enjoy. I am, uh, <laughs> I can say, an old <laughs> in the climate change. <laughs> the right word is because expert. <laughs> I started to work on climate change in 88 when we started to, to prepare the first IPCC report. And uh, I can say that uh, today we can recognize that the risks we underlined 20, 25 years ago are uh, in place because uh, the situation uh, the climate crisis uh, is, uh, is clear everywhere. And so we cannot uh, continue to waste time in addressing climate change. I believe that this is also one of the reasons of the pledge of China. You know, the President Xi Jinping uh, uh, the last uh, UN General Assembly pledge to uh, be, for China, to be carbon neutral by 2060. Uh, just to say something about, uh, about uh, the effects of this, uh, of this pledge in the, in the climate uh, negotiation, because it's the first time that China uh, pledge without in re reducing emissions in the, the, in the decarbonization of the economy without asking reciprocity or priority uh, uh, from the developed countries, mainly from UA UA USA. This is new. In the, in the climate uh, change negotiations. And I hope that this uh, will open also a new perspectives because the last uh, uh, conference in Madrid uh, failed because uh, of the uh, um, re-emerging traditional conflict between developing countries led by China and the developed world. About China, Decarbonization is uh, a tremendous challenge because we know that China is, uh, is depend depending from fossil fuel by 85%, more or less. 
and more than 60% of the energy is supplied by coal. Looking at the, the first plan uh, designed by Tsinghua University, Tsinghua University is uh, the most important university in China. I, I had the honor to be a visiting professor at that university. Uh, according to, to, the, to the first uh, plan uh, prepared by, by uh, Tsinghua University together uh, with uh, the um, authorities of uh, China, in the next, uh, in the next uh, 40 years, China should reduce uh, the use of coal by 95%, the use of natural gas by 75%, the use of oil by 65%, nuclear will grow about 40%, solar by 60%, no, sorry, by 600%, <laughs> wind by 350%, and biomass and hydro about 100%. I would like to underline that this uh, plan is not uh, a political plan, but is a, a plan supported by uh, economical and technological analysis. And uh, according to, to the evaluations uh, of the Tsinghua University and also uh, some evaluation from the Econometrics uh, of Cambridge, they believe that uh, the, the tra trajectory of the decarbonization in China will have a, a very positive effect on GDP. They believe that GDP will increase more or less about 5% because of the change in the energy metrics of China. But this is very interesting. Uh, they evaluated also that the spillover effect of the China pledge, we reduce the cost of uh, renewable technologies, renewable energy technologies in all the world. And something like um, uh, EPNED with solar. We remember that uh, uh, more or less 10 years ago, because of uh, the, the uh, uh, very high investments in solar technologies by China, solar technology, the cost of solar technology decreased a lot. And as uh, uh, Tosca said, today uh, solar is competing in many countries, uh, the cost of solar is competing in many countries uh, with uh, coal. And this is very important. But the pledge of China is uh, in a very complicated context, geopolitical context, because uh, the trade Cold War or the technological trade uh, Cold War between uh, USA and China could uh, drive the so-called decoupling of the economy. Decoupling of the economy is something we, we experience, we, we hold experience during the, the Cold War in, uh, in 50s and 60s and 70s with very high cost and also with a delay in the development of the alternative technologies, alternative so solutions. According to Deutsche Bank, in the next five years, the uh, decoupling of the economy or the cost of the technological Cold War could be about 
3.5 billion by year. It's a very high cost. And at the same time, this will, uh, will have a side effect in reducing the speed of the, in, the innovation. If we remember in, in the 60s and the 70s, the, the war between the war, the, the Cold War between, between the USA and, and Russia on Soviet Union on the space. We, we know today that working together in the exploration of space is uh, more effective than competing in the same field. And this is the same about uh, uh, climate change because the climate change, we know that we need technologies to address climate change, the development of new technologies in order to meet the energy demand, the increasing energy demand, we need at the same time that, that uh, uh, the, the a common approach to carbon price, because uh, we know very well that uh, uh, renewable technologies are today uh, in a very uh, interesting competition with fossil fuel technologies. But today, the subsidies for fossil fuels to fossil fuels are increasing the, com the, the competitiveness of fossil fuels against uh, re renewables. And so we need a common approach to address uh, the issue of carbon price in the global economy. And addressing the carbon price in global economy needs uh, a cooperation. We can say a competitive cooperation, but cooperation between right. the, the economies and not the decoupling. And so climate change is not today mainly an environmental issue. Climate cha to change today is mainly an economic and geopolitical issue. And we have to, to address this. Uh, finally, I want, to, uh, I want to, to say something about Europe because uh, the, the, the pledge of climate neutrality of Europe is very important. And I believe that the pledge of Europe uh, was the first, uh, uh, I can say, stimulus for, uh, for the, China, the China decision. But today, we have to consider that uh, Europe, in order to go on, towards the climate neutrality should work together with China, together with Japan, together with Canada, together con Califor with California. You know that California uh, committed to be carbon neutral by 2050. So uh, the, the pledge of Europe should be an engine for uh, uh, creating a global network. And in this, in this perspective, uh, for sure, the, 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 the next uh, uh, conference of parties will be very important. But I believe that before conference of parties, Europe should try to create a common ground between the countries already committed to be carbon neutral by 2050 and 2060. I don't say. Oh, do you think the high ambition solution can climate be? Climate club, like uh, William Nordhaus suggested, but something similar. We had to create uh, an environment at global level to drive the global decision, and I hope also to drive US uh, in. Uh, in this uh, commitment. Thank you, thank you to Corrado Clini. Well, we hope uh, that also the High Ambition Coalition should be one of these uh, places where, where all these uh, nations can gather and find a common ground. And of course, 
you know the main uh, uh, the main element the, the known unknown is the US election of course and that, that's going to be you know the the main uh, game changer uh, the elections on, on November 3rd on November 4th actually the US officially uh, draws out the the, the the Paris agreement uh, Trump of course has pledged to go on with that uh, Joe Biden has uh, a pledge to reinstate the the, the 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 climate agreement, but also it will have a very serious battle in Congress to really uh, produce a climate po- a U.S. climate policy that will be, uh, you know, that will convince uh, Europe and China for 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 you know the new the new direction. Uh, I, I want to to introduce uh, uh, William Mebane, especially to discuss this is an energy economist, uh, and I would like to start asking you uh, about one thing. A, a lot of people in Wall Street are saying that you know the, the, the Trump politics on climate change has been damaging the U.S. economy. I don't know, if, Williams, if you're hearing us, but uh, I would like to ask you what's your opinion about uh, uh, this statement and what what do you think will happen uh, in uh, in the U.S. election and what uh, are the possible outcomes? Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I would like to. Um address a more general question, but yes, of course, uh, if you include the coronavirus in the economic effect, uh, naturally Trump has not done a very good economic job. And I think actually the statistics are fairly close between uh, if you exclude the, 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 the coronavirus impact on the, on the economy, if you look at the beginning of, of this year, compared to what uh, Obama did, it's pretty much a toss up. I mean, both, both presidents uh, managed, to, managed to increase the, the, the economy. And uh, what I would like to, uh, to get to is, if, you, if I have a few moments, is to try to review the advantages of a Green Deal in the United States. Okay, now uh, green pro- there are n- numerous advantages, green programs of course, they create jobs. They're generally more labor intensive than many alternatives. For example, if we look at the work needed to increase the energy efficiency of new buildings, existing buildings, this primarily involves the construction sector. This is labor intensive. And the green economy already has provided 9.5 million jobs in 2016 in the US and employs about 10 times as many people as in the fossil fuel industry. Another advantage is that green opens up multiple new products and markets. I completely agree with, with Cleany about the positive effects of green plans on the GDP, also in, for the in, for United States. Uh, already the, in the US, the, uh, the green economy is worth about uh, $1.3 trillion, 7% of the US G- GNP. And a new model of consumption is emerging. The, consumer is beginning to consider the carbon footprint of products and services to be purchased. Quality is replacing quantity. Our new cities, of course, uh, are going to be much more livable. Green is going to be everywhere with more parks, trees, forests, open spaces, and the public transport will be comfortable and fast. Vehicles should be electric or hydrogen power. All the existing buildings will have stringent energy retrofits like those required now by the New York City. Adequate stormwater systems will be constructed for the low areas and transportation. And another important point, which Cleany also mentioned, is that green investments are profitable. Energy efficiency will become even more profitable as we have the energy price beginning to reflect the cost of pollution and climate change as we introduce carbon prices. This year in the United States in 2020, three fourths of the additional new capacity for electric generation will be solar and wind power. Nobody would be doing this if they were not competitive and profitable. And another very interesting aspect is that some critics of Green New Deals in the US assume that most of the funding would come from federal and state governments. However, this, is, this may not be the case workers' pension funds are beginning to turn green. They are beginning to ask companies that they hold in their portfolios, for example, the utility companies, to invest in more wind and solar. And pension funds are huge. Private pension funds have accumulated $18.8 trillion in assets, 
or 88% of the GNP in 2019. And if you add the private plus the public pension, pension, uh, pension funds, you have assets total 147% of the US GNP. You can understand if these large funds begin shifting their in investments toward green, they will have an enormous impact. Another very important instrument, somewhat forgotten, is the US municipal bond market. This is a very old market that has existed for 200 years and responsible for funding about one half of the US infrastructure. Think about the Erie Canal. Think about the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And the beauty of this is that private individual investors, stocks and bond funds, including pension funds, can't purchase municipal bonds. So it can be very widespread uh, uh, instrument. Now, there are a number of other instruments, but I don't think we're gonna have time to discuss all of them. I wanna just ask you a quick thing, yes. Um, yes. if I can jump in. Joe Biden promised a, a two trillion uh, uh, Green Deal plan uh, that you know he outlined it in a not very specific way, but it's it's there. Uh, yes. Do you think if he if he will be elected president, uh, he will be enabled to enact such a large scale plan? I, I remember that also Obama wasn't really able to to you know deploy his green agenda despite the fact he was in the White House for eight years. What's your opinion on that? Yes, I think he will, because the, the, actually the amount of money that needs to be raised compared to the potential of the U.S. financial markets is not that uh, challenging. I mean, the, the money could be there. And I think that the, um, the U.S. financial community is not stupid. They understand that, that we need to make the transition. They understand that, uh, as was also remarked, the prices and the costs of renewables have come down considerably. They understand that the, uh, the increase that we want once we gradually inter introduce a carbon tax, that energy efficiency is going to be more and more economic, more and more profitable. And so I think, you know, that, that uh, I think it's, it's going to go through. I really do. The, the, the youth movements also are very, very uh, important in, uh, in, in stressing you. and bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Ilian Kelman to, to switch off the microphone uh, because it's, uh, he specializes on, on disaster. And it's also, if I remember correctly, is the author of a book uh, uh, called, uh, oh my God, I lost my nose right there. Sorry, uh, disaster by choice. So uh, another point in the in the equation is not, of course, just the amount of money uh, uh, that are you know spent for the energy transition, but also the amount of money that are needed for adaptation, uh, because of course uh, uh, climate change is already here and we are already you know spending a lot of money. Uh, Italy is one of those countries that has been highly exposed. Uh, uh, to, to, to climate risk. Uh, it's one of the hotspots in the Mediterranean area. So, uh, uh, Ilan Kelman, I, I'd like to ask you what, what type of cost uh, we might face in the future related to climate risks and what are the potential risks at global level? Well, thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity. And what you ask is, in effect, the fundamental question. What are the climate risks or climate change risks? What is the catastrophe which we expect? And in particular, is a catastrophic future really about climate or climate change? Or are the risks coming from us? Do we actually need, need to look to ourselves? You know, of course the climate is changing rapidly. Of course we are causing it and must stop it. These points are backed up by more than 50 years, five decades of science. But if human caused climate change, is miraculously halted tomorrow, would that solve these catastrophic risks which we are creating? We have a never ending list of reports explaining our environmental destruction. Just one example from amongst many is fisheries. So fisheries collapse has been predicted by 2050, just 30 years, but actually due to overfishing, not climate change. In many places, Deforestation leads to landslide and flood disasters, 
much more than sudden. You, you muted. Okay. Uh, yeah, the host muted me. So I've now unmuted myself. <laughs> that no matter what the climate does, these disasters of landslides and floods are not natural. In fact, no disasters are natural because our activities cause a catastrophe. We place people in harm's way without adequate measures, which might be not climate. It might be no earthquake resistant structures in a seismic zone. In fact, even without climate change, our activities would continue to cause these catastrophes. Powerful interests behind overfishing and large scale logging have even argued that climate change will ruin these resources so humanity might as well exploit them now while we have the chance. This is a terrible level of discussion we hear from these powerful interests with huge resources. And they have similar interests in terms of corruption and construction, killing thousands of people in a perfectly typical earthquake. So these catastrophes, these risks, these disasters are not natural. Without climate change, these interests would still destroy people and the environment. This fundamental value of immediate exploitation of people and nature, irrespective of the long-term costs, is exactly the same, which led to the symptom of human-caused climate change. This is that the value of short-term gain for long-term pain. And this is catastrophe. This is destruction far beyond climate change. So why do we focus on climate change and look at only on these risks? Why do we not put our efforts into tackling the basic cause of our destructive values? Of course, it must include greenhouse gas emissions, but it also has to go far beyond that. It means changing the fundamental values of a minority of humanity who choose to live completely out of balance with people and the planet thereby wrecking it for the fat, vast majority. Human caused climate change is one symptom, one manifestation amongst many of these terrible values and actions. Yet we have the COP26 meeting for climate change. Now think about that, 26 meetings. This has been going on for longer than many of you have been alive with no end in sight. Where is COP1 for our values. We have a United Nations organization dedicated to climate change, but it's separate from the UN organizations for environment, development, stopping disasters, and many others. Sustainable goal 13 on climate change explicitly separates climate change from other sustainable development activities. Surely this separation is a huge risk and we should stop this separation. Because as soon as we take things apart, as soon as we put one on a pedestal, you know, no wonder we have so little action on climate change when we fail to connect with the baseline, when we fail to connect with the basis. Everything is linked and it stems from our values. So we need to stop blaming climate or climate change for these catastrophes which we are creating. The real crisis is how we think and act based on our values. The catastrophe of the future is not climate change per se. It is our values which cause so, this destructive climate change and much, much more. So what do you, what, what you suggest, Ilan? I mean, at that political level, given that we are a diplomatic meeting, I mean, what should we do in, a, in one minute? Number one, I've put my links to social media. So join me in the discussion in order to ensure that we enfold climate change within the wider issues of our values, our actions, and our behaviors. That is what we need to do at the diplomatic level, but far beyond for ourselves. Thanks, thanks, Helen. Also, I invite all the reader to have a look at your book, uh, which is the title is Disaster by Choice, which clearly explain your point of view. Thank you. Thank you so much for this very interesting perspective, which is, uh, I think, quite new inside uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the climate uh, crowd. Uh, next, we have, uh, sadly, William Baker couldn't join us. Uh, I would love to have him with us because he's the executive director of Presidential Climate Action Project, which, which is a 
an initiative that actually I think was started during the first Obama administration to, uh, you know, uh, follow the idea of presence of the United States with climate change, but sadly can't be with us today. Uh, so I want to invite uh, Gianmaria Sannino, who is the head of climate and impact modeling laboratory uh, of the Department of Sustainability and of Production and Territorial System at Enea, which is the international, which is the Italian agency for the environment, uh, uh, former agency of the atomic energy. Gianmaria, can you hear us? Yes, I know. I perfectly. know. So you wanna you wanna share a presentation? I think uh, yeah. Either uh, I or uh, the the uh, the host can help you doing that. I'm actually currently looking at that. Oh yeah, yeah, you can yeah, do that. You see it. So, ciao Emanuele. Hi everybody. So I'm a cl climate scientist. So I'm not an economist. I'm not a politician. So I I would prefer to give you some numbers. I mean numbers that you. Uh, more or less see every day, but I mean, I, I want to also show you something different in terms of climate change. So first of all, let me say that the 2020 years, of course, will remain in history for the coronavirus outbreak. This is certainly true, but 2020, at least for the history of climate, will be the one of the most warmer uh, year since 88. Uh, actually, it will be the first one or the second in the rank. So uh, at the moment, the first one is 2016, the second is tw uh, 2019 and so on. As you see, most of the warmer years are just after 2000. And 2020, this year, will be the first one or the second one. So just before uh, 2016 or after 2016. Uh, but if we look, I mean, at the temporal evolution of the surface temperature, we see that starting from 1880, that is just the year where we collect uh, most of the, the, the data all around the, the, our planet. So the beginning of the record is 1880, and you see that it's a, a, a slowly, but it's a, a steadily increase up to 2020. And, uh, and we know, of course, that the, the problem is the CO2 is the gas in the atmosphere that are, I mean, uh, like uh, CO2, methane, and, and, and so on. And also the CO2 emission is always rising. Even in 2020, the concentration of CO2 is now reached this very high values, 415 ppm. So a very high values that actually we didn't see in the last 1 million of years. So from this point of view, we are just living in a planet with an atmosphere which has a, key, a chemical composition that is completely different from the past, I mean, I see the past means before the last ice ages. So, and as we already know, there's a, a correlation between the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the temperature of our planet. So if we increase the CO2 in the atmosphere, the temperature of our atmosphere starts to increase. So this is something that all the people knows and even the new generation, now they know better than us what is the correlation between CO2 and temperature increase over the planet. But what about the global fossil emission? So we are speaking now in this, let's say, web conference about what we have to do to reduce the global uh, fossil emission. But the situation right now is like this. So now we are emitting something like 37 gigaton of CO2 equivalent in 2000. And, uh, 19, 20, uh, 19. So we are still putting in the atmosphere huge amount of CO2. So we are doing, let's say, let me say nothing. So there's a lot of uh, political commitment or let's say there's a lot of very nice idea, but the, the, the reality is that we are still emitting a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. But let's so, me, let me ask you this. Isn't correct that, I mean, given the, the actual projection uh, 
uh, with the with the INDC, we should be peaking uh, at uh, 2030. I mean, that that's of course. Yeah, I mean, this is just uh, more or less the receipt that we 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 want to apply. And I mean, just my last slide is just the receipt that we should follow at global level. So that's this is why the temperature is still increasing. I mean, uh, no matter the the last, let's say the the, the COP 20. Uh, five, the Paris Agreement, and so on. So the reality is that the CO2 is increasing because we are putting a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. So, and what about the climate? So what about the climate of our planet? So we have had the last 10 years of record-breaking climate extremes. We know that we had fire blazes in Australia, Siberia, California, and the Amazons floods in China, Bangladesh, and India, just to cite the main floods. Heat waves across the entire Northern Hemisphere. But the most dangerous, let's say, threats are what we call in climate science, the tipping point. So we are crossing a lot of tipping points. A tipping point is, is like a, a threshold. So if we go through this threshold, uh, these tiny changes could push the system, in our case, the climate system in a completely new state. So these are just the map of the uh, tipping points that are, we are just changing currently now. So we are only a few decades away from an Arctic without sea ice in summer. So this is the North Pole that we know is one of the climate hotspots in the of, in, on, in the planet. In Siberia, the permafrost is already now melting at a dramatic scale. Greenland is losing uh, losing trillion of tons of ice, and Greenland is very very close to the tipping point. And the same is also for the South Pole. So West Antarctic maybe have already crossed the tipping points. And even the most solid glacier that we have on the heart, that is the East Antarctic, is going to be unstable. So, and of course, if we have a lot of melting glaciers, the sea level will increase. And this is the situation of sea level since 1992, so the satellite era. And uh, if we go a little bit in the past, we see that we already have increased a lot, 35 centimeters since 8080. So the sea level is increasing, this is a reality. And uh, what about the other tipping points? So the Amazon rainforest is weakening and most probably it will start to emit carbon within 15 years. So it is not more a carbon sink, but it will be a carbon emitter. And also the coral reef, as you know, already half of the Great Barrier Reef has already died. So these are the tipping points. And also, of course, the northern great forests of the north are burning. And the Atlantic Ocean circulation, that is the main climate, uh, climate driver, is slowing down. This is a very dangerous for the entire climate of our planet. So we are very close to cross all these uh, uh, tipping points. So just looking at the tipping points, the evidence from these tipping points, we can say that we are, from a climatic point of view, in a state of a planetary emergency. So we have to act, we have to act now, what is the receipt? So the receipt is very simple. So if we want to apply the Paris Agreement, that is just to limit the temperature of our planet well be below the two degrees uh, centigrade, that is 1.5, this is the golden number. We need to reduce the CO2 to 25 gigaton. That means from the actual 36.8 to 25 by 2030, that is just a, a systematic reduction year by year from now to 2030 of 7.6%. And just for chance, just because of the coronavirus outbreak, we are very close to this number, 7.6 percentage of reduction. But this is just because there's the outbreak. 
So we have to do the same reduction even the next year when hopefully the coronavirus outbreak will be over. So that's all Which from my side. Which we know is quite impossible. Yeah, it's very, it's not impossible, but it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. So we need to work hard to, to use as much as possible all the renewables that we, are, that we already know uh, they are working and even looking at new renewables that can also help the standard, let's say, renewable that are just the solar and the wind. But we can also use, for example, the ocean. So the wave of the ocean, the current of the ocean, just to, pro to produce energy. This is what the EU is, for example, trying to do in the next few years. So this is the receipt. Emmanuel, if you are able to Thank apply you. this receipt, maybe we can reduce the emergency. Well, I guess that's a global, the global challenge, you know, to, to scale up technology, to make sure that the proper policy are in place. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's even easy, hard, actually it's even hard uh, to decide a simple solution. Uh, I can imagine uh, uh, those, those, those type of solution that requires, you know, a, a, a global commitment, a larger scale. That's why the COP, 20, the COP negotiation took 26 years, actually took uh, uh, tw uh, 21, no, yeah, 21 years to reach the Paris Agreement. So, uh, you know. It's, yeah, but it's, we don't have 20 years now. So I, I know, I to... know. That, 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 that's where uh, reality and, and politics and diplomacy clashes. Well, thank you so much for your, for your very interesting uh, summary of the climate situation, I guess, for all the students following us has been a very, very important to, to remember and to put clearly in their mind. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I will get back you, to you later. Uh, next, we have uh, Joseph Abramovich from, uh, uh, from Jerusalem, and which is actually excited to tell us some good news because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an, uh, an entrepreneur in the energy sector, and he might have some some of the solutions um, uh, that, that are uh, needed today for, for, the, uh, for, the, for the decarbonizing our economy. So, Joseph, are you with us? Yes, what, thank what, you, what, thank you. What's, uh, what, what is necessary, what can be done today to speed up uh, the, the, the low carbon transition on a global scale and what are you doing with Energia Global? Okay, great. Thank you. Your Excellency, the participants, and especially the students, uh, Shalom. Um, even though I'm Jewish and I'm here in the holy city of Jerusalem, when it comes to climate and when it comes to economic development for the uh, most vulnerable populations on the planet, uh, His Holiness the Pope speaks for me. Um, I have to say I'm still recovering from the, uh, the brutal honesty and wake up call of the last two pres presentations. Like, uh, I'm glad we, we hopefully recording this and I love the PowerPoint. Um, what I do think a um, Israeli entrepreneurial uh, representative can bring to this conversation is a bold quadruple bottom line business model to scale climate hope, to scale climate hope. And the way we look at it is there's two kinds of climate hope. There's climate hope for the developed world and there's a climate hope for the developing world. And there are different strategies in a sense. Um, the, the holy grail for the developed world is this notion of how do you get you know, to, to, to super high numbers of renewables in a very short period of time. We're told by the UN we need at least a 45% reduction. Um, and the way that, that we positioned it here in Israel is we, we took a, an area of the country and we said, we want to get from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea, including a port city of Eilat with hotels and all the communities. Um, our goal was by 2020 to get to 100% daytime solar, 100% daytime solar by 2020 and 100% day and night by 2025. And the idea is that if we could work it out, if we could work out the kinks, work out the grid, work out the economics, all the zoning, everything else, that would be a model for Israel. And then Hopefully could, we can go into COP26 with, with, with uh, great news that Tosca can uh, raise the bar uh, on everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm actually really happy to say we are six months consecutive, 100% daytime solar in that region of the country. And um, it is possible. 
it is doable, it's preferable, it's cheaper, it's technically feasible, and we have done it. This is the proof text. So we need, we need to up our, up our goals uh, worldwide. And you know, we heard for a call, call for boldness. And uh, we actually wanna say 100%, uh, certainly solar, because you're not yet getting into the storage and other issues by, by 2030. And I, like on the one hand, um, Israel just doubled its commitment essentially uh, from uh, Paris, where I was uh, on the negotiating team from only 17% uh, by 2030 to yesterday to 30%. And that's totally unacceptable. We, we believe it should be, we in the environmental community believe it should be 100% daytime solar and we're, we're fighting that battle. So that's a developed world and we all need to do this. And there's no reason not to do it other than corruption or no political backbone. Um, but how to do it, we've already proven this. So let's raise that bar. In terms of the developing world, um, uh, no one had ever done commercial scale, utility scale in sub-Saharan Africa. There's 600 million people though without access to power, a couple hundred million burning expensive polluting diesel, right? Um, and uh, the idea was, could we take the model from the south of Israel and bring that to Africa? Please to say we did the first utility scale in sub-Saharan Africa, supplying Rwanda's, 6% of Rwanda's power. And it's a quadruple bottom line approach. And this, this is kind of important because th this is what drives social, political, uh, economic change. It has to have an economic bottom line, a humanitarian bottom line, environmental and a developmental or um, development or geostrategic. We are currently building during COVID in Burundi, probably the third poorest country on the planet. And that field, hopefully by Christmas, will supply 15% of that country's generation capacity. And from there, we're gonna keep encouraging them to do more. This is doable, possible, worthwhile. It's really a question of you know, leadership, connecting all the dots on, on this Zoom and others. And um, we also have a program moving forward in Ethiopia with 10 universities. And the idea is, I know the students here, is that it's not only in terms of supplying green energy to the universities, but it's also a living laboratory for capacity building, given that Italy has a bit of a interesting history with Ethiopia, perhaps this is something we can work together on. But at this point, um, we're saying there's a business incentive and model and proof of concept in place to go to 100% solar almost anywhere in the world. And I can answer any of the technology questions by 2030. Um, and if we can raise that bar at COP26, and we're happy to play a role in that, we'll be able to mitigate uh, some of the really difficult things we, we just heard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph, for, for your very active and optimistic contribution. We, we need that as well. Uh, grazie Francescato, we are, uh, you are the last of this round, but I, I want to ask you a very specific question. It's, uh, you know, what's your take in all of this? I mean, clearly we have been uh, struggling to reach a global agenda for decarbonizing our economy. Uh, we know the complexity that are at stake. We know that sometimes there are steps backwards, like has happened in the US. Uh, sometimes are a leap forward, like Europe is, seems to be doing recently, accelerating something that was already in the uh, European DNA. Uh, we've seen China stepping up. Uh, we've seen a lot of other countries that are actually accelerating this transition. Uh, we think also the, you know, the, the, the energy market changing a lot. Oil prices have never been this low. Uh, the financial market is finally investing in uh, technologies uh, like the one Joseph uh, is promoting. So we, we're really seeing Wall Street, uh, Piazza Fari, all the major uh, financial players really, really putting their attention on, on, the, on the greening of the economy, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in not such a good way. So what's your take? We will uh, actually be able to meet at least the 2030s goal and we will be able to really start to decrease uh, this, this line we have seen uh, uh, we have seen in uh, Gianmaria Sannino presentation before. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer of the festival and the participant and the youth listening to us, and I hope then we'll intervene. And I want to stress two key words that are of paramount importance if we really want to be up to the daunting challenges we are facing. And the first word is time. You see my white hair, okay? 
we are running out of time. We are terribly, terribly late. Because, you know, the first time I heard the word climate change was back in 1972. We are talking of the past century, the past millennium even. I was a young journalist and I was already interested in environment and development. And I attended the first UN conference in Stockholm, 1972. It was also the year when the MIT book came out, The Means to Growth, that has been of such importance for the environmental thinking and the environmental vision. So, um, I was lucky enough to meet people, maestri, and I'm now talking to young people. You need maestri, you need the experts to initiate you to this new world. And uh, I had met Teddy Gosmith, who was the founder, the controversial and very brilliant founder of the first British environmental magazine, The Ecologist. And people like Barry Commoner, he was the author of bestsellers like the, the Closing Circle and The Poverty of Power. He was one of the first, actually, not only in the USA, but in the whole world, to highlight the links between the environmental crisis, the economic and the social crisis. At the time, the main issue at Stockholm was population growth, which disappeared now from the scenarios. Neomaltusians were clashing against the anti-Maltusians and the majority of third world country had the slogan that was put forward all the time that, that ran, the best bill is development, saying you want to be developed, now we want to have the same kind of opportunities that you had. Well, it took 20 years and we had to reach the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, which I attended as a newly elected president of WWF Italy, to establish climate change as one of the major global problems to be tackled at global level. I'm not going to dwell on the following various scopes. Let us jump to 2015, to the Paris Agreement. It was also the year of the SDGs, the 17 SDGs being launched at the UN, not by chance the year of the world famous Laudato Si and Citrica by Pope Francis. 215 means 43 years after Stockholm. It's a lifetime. So did we really advance on the task of mitigation and adaptation there at the core of the policies? Of course, undoubtedly, we can count on some relevant step forwards like uh, the Paris Agreement being probably the most relevant, uh, the SDGs and the Green Deal and so forth, as well as major positive changes that have been highlighted, for instance, in business and in, in civil society and so forth. But to be honest, we can sum this all up with a drastic judgment pronounced not only by environmentalists and grief movements or youth movements such as Fridays for Future nowadays, but by thousands of scientists all over the world starting with IPCC, in 98, which was established, as you remember, in 1988. And the judgment, to be frank, is too little, too late. Too little, too late. Time again is to clean words. If we had 50 years in front of us to mitigate emissions, to adapt to climate change, well, I, you know, I would take it easy. But according to science, the time window is rapidly closing. We have perhaps 10 years. We don't, we are really running out of time. And since the other world they want to be to bring in the forefront is complexity, and since complex issues require complex answers, the dire combination of lack of time and daunting complexity is making our task really, really difficult. Of course, we need to maintain an horizon of hope. We need to value the positive steps and build on them, but we cannot delude ourselves into thinking that we are doing enough. We are not doing enough. And you know what's the main point? I've been in politics 13 years, so I know about it. Very few of the politicians, very few of the decision makers have understood the basic nature of climate change. It is a huge geopolitical issue with devastating impacts, not only on natural ecosystem, but on the economy in large and current lifestyles. Think of the links with huge problems affecting us, like migration. You know, extreme events make it make cause or worsen by uh, migration caused or worsen by extreme events uh, due to climate change lead to disrupting communities, social life, economic patterns. Let's just mention Sahel, for instance, in, 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 in Africa, or let's just mention uh, Amazon in South America. According to recent surveys, we should expect a sharp increase in the number of climate refugees that could reach the staggering number of 2,050 million people in the next decades. Not only we have not yet acknowledged the real nature of climate change, that is a huge political issue, but now, politicians and decision makers are paying lip so much to this concept and invoke sustainability at large as an ad adequate answer, but there is a blatant lack of coherence between what they say and what they do. 
which is mainly business as usual, thus maintaining the very production and consumption patterns that are the cause of climate change. Do you want examples? There are plenty. Take what's happening right now in Europe on the agricultural policy, the PAC, which I remind you is a huge chunk of the EU budget, almost 30%. Well, while paying lip homage to the iconic Green Deal, the uh, three major political forces of the European Parliament are actually pushing to continue support for industrial agriculture, intensive cattle farming, pesticides, and so on and so forth, privileging multinationals instead of small and medium-sized farming. And they are doing it now, in the middle of the pandemic. Even though it's now widely recognized that 70% of the infective diseases, uh, in, including the coronavirus, originate from disruption of the ecosystem. Nobody mentions it in talk show or you know, articles, very few people. For instance, forest destruction is bringing wild species into ever close, closer contact with human beings, thus promoting a start of the species, spillover. Now, this lack of, of coherence is not even the worst plague at political level, because now we have to face stubborn denial of climate change. Think of Bolsonaro, think of Trump, and we have mentioned how important the upcoming elections are going to be uh, as far as climate change issues concerned, not only in the United States, but in the whole world. So we have, how do we face these new challenges? How do we face denial, greenwashing, lack of coherence, lack of awareness of the real nature of climate change and so forth? Uh, now, I think first and foremost, and I agree with Ilan Kilman totally, we need a quantic leap of collective awareness. We need an holistic view. The first rule of ecology is to soutien. Everything is connected with everything else. We need, we need to understand it and put it into practice and we are not doing it yet. We know what we're supposed to do. We are not starting from zero. We are focused and studying and examining and pile up all the policies that we have to implement. We have implemented them up to a certain extent, but it's not sufficient. So let's push forward with full determination and speed, and let's transform the promises of SDGs, Green Deal, and so forth into concrete policies by building on the positive steps that we've already done. For instance, and I'm going to uh, talk about the next months, we need to take into account that on October that on, um, this year, on the 7th of February, European Parliament voted for an ambitious climate law setting a target on 60% reduction of CO2 emission by 2030. It is a very successful, unprecedented step toward, but the EU now, European Commission and the Council must now align their position with the uh, proposal of the European Parliament. On top of this landmark target for emission reduction, the European Greens, I am still very, very much in contact with them because I've been a leader, female leader of the European Greens uh, in the past decade, have also proposed to include further uh, relevant elements of climate protection. For instance, a permanent interdisciplinary and independent advisory panel on climate, an end to all fossil fuel subsidies, improve access to climate justice, and a specific EU carbon budget. These, along with the 2030 targets, will need to be defended already now uh, ahead of the negotiation with the Council and the European Commission. We have to push for an even stronger reduction, 65%, as asked by scientists, environmental and youth movement, especially Fridays for Future. We need to be vigilant, nobody's mentioned it yet, about the expenditure of the huge funds for the so-called green recovery uh, after and during the coronavirus pandemic. We, I remind you that 37% of the funds of the next generation will have to be used for the ecological transition, for the energetic transition. Let's watch over the fair and sustainable use of this massive bank of, of funds. Uh, we already have some encouraging examples, for instance, the Ecobonus in Italy, you know, for building renovation and urban regeneration. Other people have listed the, the concrete set forwards we can, uh, we can make. A green recovery means that we can achieve various goals, combined together, increase in energy efficiency and renewables, promotion of circular economy, increase of green jobs, uh, change in the consumption pattern. So we can here really have, and I conclude here, a marriage between ecology and economy, because I always tell when I go to the university, talking to the university or in the schools, I always tell the students, please look inside the words because you know words have a meaning and it is not by chance that economy and ecology start with the same prefix echo, which means from the Greek oikos, which means house, 
We have just one common house. The planet is the only one. And we really need to do all our efforts. And then maybe in the second part, I will also talk about what green diplomacy can do because now there is a, uh, we, we can make big step forward to make Europe, um, to make Europe have a leadership role. Some people say Europe should be a mediator, leader who mediator. That means using its influence, competencies and skills at diplomatic level to mobilize even the most reluctant countries. And I really think that now the moment is now and that we cannot waste any more time. I, you know, I got old <laughs> fighting for, <laughs> for planet Earth and I would like my grandchildren, the grandchildren of, of every one of us to lead a, a more harmonized life with nature and the rest of mankind, you know, the holistic oh, view. Is so. Oh, please, so. Thank you so much to Grazia Francescato. I already seen there are some raised hands. Uh, so we, sadly, we don't have much time because we have only 20, 25 minutes left because I have been told that at 6.30 we have to leave, uh, 6.30, 6.35, we can take some extra minutes, but we have to, there are other, other events taking place. Uh, I, I wanna just uh, uh, quickly give the floor uh, to Tosca Barruco because I promised her uh, to give some space for the for the uh, youth event related to COP26. Uh, uh, so, so if you can explain us in a, in a minute and then we will leave the last part uh, of the discussion for the Q&A and probably will focus a lot into diplomacy because that's that's what seems to be the, the interest of, 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 the, of the request here. Um, I'll be short. Tosca, uh, please. It's a promise. Ahead. I'll be short. One minute, I'm not sure, but I'll do my best. So um, uh, as a partner of the UK in COP26, easily will be hosting some preparatory events in Milan and among them, I'm sending you a link, hoping it works. I try to send, I will try to send you a video. I'm not sure it will work, but anyway, you'll find it. Um, we will host an event that is called the Youth for Climate. It will be a two and a half days event organized with the UN, in which 400 youth from the 200 UN constituency countries uh, will be uh, chosen by the UN to represent the world youth. And this will be back to back with the pre-COP. The pre-COP is an um, informal negotiating session. It will, we will try to ease the path to Glasgow, trying to close uh, some um, hot potatoes that we are left uh, from, the, uh, hot, uh, from the negotiations. So um, what do we expect? A lot expect? of hot potatoes. Yeah, well, <laughs> what we expect is uh, to make the world, the youth empowered, to hear their voices and make sure their voices are heard in the negotiating rooms, because we will have a session uh, in common with the PICOP uh, in which the youth constituency can present uh, what they uh, are their expectations. So it will be an interactive session and um, that will be uh, what we are trying to, to put as added value, the, the, the youth participation in the negotiating process. I'm thank sending you, you a you. link for a very nice video. Hope it works. Here it is. Yep, you can see on the chat. Thank you so much, Tosca Baruco. I wanna, I wanna give voice to the students that have been here. It's a very, very long list of people attending the event. So uh, I hope not everyone will have a question. Otherwise, we will be not ending tonight. Uh, the first in the list is Mulic Arman. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. You can okay. open your microphone and your video and ask the question. Please go ahead. Um, hello, can you hear me? Sure. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much for a very thought-provoking and eye-opening panel. Um, my name is Arman Mulic and I'm a student of global governance at the University of Rome Tervergata. Uh, and uh, the panels that really sparked an interest for me personally were the one from Professor Kelman and Ms. Francescato. Uh, and although I can address the, the, the question only uh, to, to them, I would kind of like to hear like, the, the approach of uh, as many uh, panelists as possible. Um, now, with regards to the idea of shifting the focus from the issue as something that we blame um, to us as the responsible ones, um, taking this perspective, what should the government do to ensure this holistic mindset shift 
uh, as they're combating a crisis referring to the climate crisis within another crisis referring to the pandemic, of course. How do we, again, in the words of uh, Professor Kelman, connect to the baseline in such um, uncertain and baffling times? Um, I hope I was clear. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank and, you. Uh, for, the sake, for the sake of giving everyone a voice, also to give all the speaker a possibility, I, I asked just to limit the answer to the two people you mentioned, so we also keep on time. Sure. Uh, Ilan, can you start first? Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, that's an excellent question. For me, governments supposedly are meant to represent the people. So what should governments do? Well, actually represent the people. And then the people have to demand that we hit the fundamentals and we solve them, which means not only would we solve climate change and the pandemic, but all the other catastrophes and disasters which we experience. So I really wish that governments would actually represent the people. Grazie. Occhio al microfono, watch out with your microphone. Yeah. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. So, dear David, I've been in politics for um, 14 years because I wanted to help putting the climate change on the desk, you know, uh, as a main polit geopolitical issue, as I said before. I think that governments should do something very simple keep their promises, keep the Green Deal promise, keep the SDGs promise. It's, although it's very complicated, we must know that, to transfer promises into reality. Complexity, we always have to keep in mind that complexity makes it very difficult for governments to govern, especially when you had you know, cl uh, climate change and then the pandemics and coronavirus, unfortunately, will not be the only one. But then there is space for everyone. Everyone has to take responsibility, you not know, just governments. The scientists are doing their bit, environmentalists are doing their bit. Our job is mainly to stimulate, to uh, you know, add pressure so that governments act and do something. And youth, they have a tremendous role now. And especially, I'm a woman, let me say, I'm very happy to, to see uh, how much gender issues are weighing more and more, not only in the climate change, uh, the climate change problem, but let's say on every aspect of uh, uh, the big change that we need to promote. I don't think that it is by chance that, uh, for instance, Fridays for Future Movement mainly has young leaders, young female leaders all around the world, it's not just Greta Thunberg. So um, I think there is room for improvement and I think that improvement can be brought about by all the whole of society. This is extremely important because as I said before, Complex issues require complex answers, and this cannot just be, uh, you know, delegated to the governments. We can all do and play our parts, and I'm pretty sure the young people like you can do a lot for it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Grant. very much. And uh, yeah, I also believe sometimes we have to rethink also our, the organization of the states, because sometimes uh, ministers think too much in silos. That something has been discussed for, for, for years, and I think uh, we're seeing recently agencies that are you know, run uh, among different ministers so that the, the idea should be uh, to have climate change as a topic that really goes across all the possible ministers. Uh, the next question is from uh, uh, Maraviglia Rihanna. You can open your microphone and your camera so you can address it. Thank you, um, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. My name is Arianna Maviglia and I'm a global governance student in Torbegata. And I have a question for Mr. Kelman. Um, during your presentation, you told us that we are failing to connect the bases and that intervened elements are often separated. My question is uh, very briefly, why? And what do we need to do in order to change that? Why do we separate? Because people like silos, people like their territory, and they often do not like yielding some of that to others who may be able to assist. What do we do differently? That's up to us. Please join us in connecting. Please demand that the leaders of politicians stop separating and use science in order to back up what we all want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila and Kelman, also for this very short answer that allows us to have more and more questions. Uh, next in line, we have uh, Giulio Croce. You can open your microphone and address the panel. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Okay, so my question is actually for any of the panelists that actually wants to answer. Um, we talked much tonight about like how the 
climate uh, change problem is being addressed by governments. So what is China going to do? How Europe is going to behave? How the United States are going to behave? But I'm told, and I think it's actually shared knowledge, that many companies, I actually look at the, looked that up, and it's um, 100 companies create the 71% of the whole pollutions. Um, so I wanted to actually ask how we could address the pollution problem, the emission problem, also from a private sector point of view, what could we do as people, as government, and as humanity in general? Thank you. So um, I'll do Thank 10 so seconds uh, for, the, for the first. A great question. Uh, the, the top polluters there happen to be oil and gas companies. And so we need to end the $5 trillion in subsidies that diff the same governments that we're lobbying right now to, to up their climate goals need to also end the subsidies and the tax breaks for the oil and gas industry, which is which are your main polluters. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to hear also Corrado Clini on this, which is, you know, has been uh, uh, director general also for many years and, uh, you know, knows the, yeah. the role that the state can play also in regulating uh, the private yes. sector. She wants to say that uh, actually many, many companies in the world are developing, are using low carbon technologies. But the competitiveness of such technologies is affected by the policies of the government supporting, as uh, Abramovich said, by subsidies. I believe that, uh, that uh, a positive lobby of the main global companies working on low carbon technologies could drive the government to change the policies. We need to change such a policies. Thank you, Corrado. Is someone I want to add something very quickly? Yes, could could I, could I add one thing? Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, the Nobel Prize uh, winning uh, economist uh, Nordhaus pointed out that to enforce global improvements in, in climate, we may have to put tariffs on the exports from countries not making sufficient climate improvements. This is the stick. And uh, of course, this would raise prices. And uh, we don't like that, of course. And so I think really diplomacy has a major role here to try to uh, avoid this. But sometimes to get things moving, you have to have a big stick. And the, this could be the biggest stick. Another my, uh, point I would like that gets back to the first uh, two questions is that um, I think to a certain extent, we need to market climate change in a more positive way. And we have to want climate change and we have to think about uh, the positive aspects as, as, as being something attractive, something that is going to be better for our cities, better for our homes, better for our health. And so it's not a question just of the obligations, which of course are very, very important and we understand those. But if we market climate change as just obligations, we're losing all the power of making climate change sexy, making it uh, desirable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to William Mabane. And I, I, I think it is, it is very right, uh, you know, putting policy in place and putting uh, uh, the right tax strategies can help to accelerate the transition because of course, uh, still the majority of the pollution comes from uh, oil company and coal company, but of course also from our way of consuming energy and consuming goods. Uh, I have in line also to Yishime Perside or Perside, I don't know how you pronounce, how to pronounce correctly your name, but the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm Perside, um, I'm in my second year of global governance. And uh, I have a question about the renewable energy. Sorry, would you mind just getting closer to the microphone because I can't hear you properly. Uh, can you hear me well now? Okay. 
So my question uh, is about renewable energy. In the beginning, we have seen how the price of renewable energy has reduced, if I heard very well, up to 80%. And that implies the increase in consumption. But as we continued, we have seen how there might be some uh, human activities which are still stimulating the climate change. In fact, uh, with the presentation, I've seen how CO2 levels continue to increase in the atmosphere. So uh, my question is, is there anything that the renewable sources of energy, uh, is there anything they are promising, for example, a safer future, or we should focus on the human activities that, that are leading to the climate change? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, do, do you have anyone you want to address specifically or just to open to everyone? Um, I don't remember all the names of the panelists, but if there is anyone who can answer this, uh, I would appreciate. Thank you again. Thank you. Who wants to answer this question? It's open to everyone, so everyone can have the floor. Joseph, maybe you are the energy guy. Yeah, I mean, just to understand the question, what are the benefits um, uh, across the board? So I, I think uh, the panelist was talking about the Green New Deal, but, but because we're working in places like Africa, we're, we're not only emphasizing climate, um, but economic and social development. Uh, we think that's really key. Uh, energy, you can't, you know, if our goal is to lift human dignity, um, then without energy access, um, you, you can't have real education or healthcare or uh, the dignity that comes with uh, employment. And what the international community used to do when they would bring in energy, they'd bring in diesel generators. And, and so then you have the poorest people on the planet finally getting some energy, paying the highest prices for the most destructive fuel coming usually from dictators. So it, the, the system was very, very broken. Um, I, I think it depends who you're speaking with. And some of you are asking about how do you change policy? So I think for some people in government, you can make the, you can talk about the climate and some of the start, you know, things we heard tonight may move the needle there, but for other people, it may be the jobs uh, or economic growth, um, or, you know, there are no wars fought over solar fields and wind farms. That's, that's, that's only oil and uranium and things like that. So you want to tell you your arguments, but the, the, the clean energy, uh, you know, ticks so many of the UN SDGs. So targeted in strategic ways so that you can be effective with policymakers. Thank you. Also, I think uh, right now we should focus, especially on the technology already in place and of course, investing in newer technologies, but you know, the, the solar and wind, it's already there and uh, you know, it's possible to scale it up at a very large scale. So uh, I do truly believe that in terms of the economy, of course, we should focus on alternatives, but right now we already have a lot of technologies that are in place. Probably next is hydrogen, which seems to be attracting a lot of resources and a lot of attention right now. Uh, there is a last question from uh, uh, Giovanni D'Agostino. Please, uh, you can uh, you can open your microphone and address well, that. Uh, good evening, everyone, and good morning or good afternoon to some of our panelists. Uh, my name is Giovanni D'Agostino. I'm a global governance student at uh, University of Rome, Tor Vergata, second year student. And by far, I want to say it personally, this was one of the best uh, events that we've seen in the Diplomacy Festival. So thank you so much to all the panelists. Really, thank you. Um, we all know that there are many people employed in the fossil fuel sector. We have, uh, we have states in the United States like Pennsylvania, whose residents rely heavily on incomes of workers who are employed in the non-renewable sectors. Most of them are low skilled. So the problem is how do you retrain these people to get, to get them into the job market of, of a renewable sector? My question is how do we shape the, an environmental friendly policy since we're talking about shaping policies, but at the same time, we preserve an already flimsy job market, especially after Corona. Thank yeah. you. We, we, we have one minute left because at, <laughs> uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, 630 they will close our microphone. Uh, who wants to close uh, with this question about the just transition? Just one quick word about the just transition. I'm happy. I mean, it was said in the panel, it creates jobs. We have over $5 trillion a year subsidies to fossil fuel companies. Use that money to reskill, to train the workers, and the jobs are safer and healthier. So they are not only richer, but they die much less on the job. Thank you. 
30 seconds, uh, Corrado Clini, you, you will be the one ending the panel because I think at 6 30 they will. Cut I it just out. remember uh, Giovanni in the past, two centuries ago, many people worked on horses. And then uh, with the, <laughs> the <laughs> cars, they <laughs> lost the job, they changed the job. We had to be ready to look uh, at the future have in mind that maybe the people working in fossil fuel today will not be able, the holder in particular, to do something different, something new. But we cannot imagine that the obsolete technologies should drive the future of our world. Thank you so much. I think that we close exactly on the right time. I want to thank you. Uh, the Festival de la Diplomazia. I want to thank all the panelists for being here. I appreciate the fact that the students really enjoyed this panel. I hope uh, uh, you all can follow all the, all the panelists on their social media so you can continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, you all. Grazie. Grazie. Very powerful. Grazie. Uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs>